What is the easiest way to double your money? Obviously, you could go gamble at a casino or gamble in the stock market, but at the end of the day, the word easy implies that you're extremely confident you'll actually be able to pull it off and you'll be able to pull it off really quickly. So no matter what your profession is, whether you're a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, a plumber, a tutor, anything you could pretty much imagine, the easiest way to double your money would obviously be to just get a second job. So the moment you realize that your employer really is just your first customer, all you need to do is find a way to service as many of these customers as you possibly can. So before I was the president of Jordan Belfort's companies, The Real Wolf of Wall Street, and before I became an advisor to a number of other celebrities and pro athletes and high net worth individuals, the main thing that I did was create a business in Silicon Valley. And the reason I created a business there is because I always worked there as an employee. I used to be a head of talent for a Silicon Valley tech startup where I was in charge of everything related to hiring and that startup ended up becoming worth well over a billion dollars. But the key thing is that I realized that that work that I provided as an employee for that company, I could be providing that same work for many, many other startups. All I needed to do was figure out how to actually service as many of these startups as I could and eventually find a way to have other people help me. That by definition is how to really build a business that you know is going to be the easiest way to actually succeed in business. And funny enough, because I know the actual finances of so many different business owners, the only ones who really make a lot of personal income well into the millions of dollars tend to be the people who turn their profession into a business because by definition a profession is something that society is telling you that people really need. It's almost never the people who come up with some sort of clever scheme because any sort of scheme tends to be very temporary in nature and it's not in servitude to a lot of people. And back in 2018 and 2019, I spent months and months writing out my exact process of exactly how anyone can turn their profession into a business. And I originally wanted that to be a course that everybody would take. The reality is that I've always been a private person and so I wasn't comfortable promoting it and marketing it. And my simple solution now is just to give it out for free. I just want everybody to go through this and realize that there's nothing more that you need in life than this single video, I promise you, will give you every single thing that you'll need to multiply your income. It goes into the heart of how to get clients, how to service those clients. After you go through the training, please schedule a one-on-one -on -one call because every single person I've spoken to has said that their life has dramatically changed just from that call because at the heart of it, all we're really doing is taking this training and figuring out how to exactly implement it into your specific situation. So if you can, again, please schedule the call. I promise your life will change from it and that's a full guarantee. And with all that being said, I really hope you enjoy this training. Thank you so much. So firstly, sales in general used to be difficult for me until I had one very significant realization. And that was that intrinsically, I must already have all the answers on how to sell anything. The reason is that we're all human beings, so since I know what it would take for someone else to convince me of something, I can use that same technique onto others. Let's take the wildest hypothetical scenario. If I ask myself, what would it take for someone to convince me that my parents aren't actually my parents? I would get a very simple answer. They would just need to show me footage of my parents admitting to that, and possibly my true birth certificate proving it. They can also fill in this narrative by showing me footage of my original parents explaining what had happened, and a message from 23andMe saying that they've matched my DNA to my real parents. Even just one of these elements could be enough to convince me. The truth is that it doesn't take much at all to convince someone of anything. You can believe that you're completely healthy and it just takes one doctor to tell you that you have a severe medical condition for you to think otherwise. You can think that a certain celebrity is very kind until the news tells you one story that paints them out to be horrible. You can choose not to believe in aliens until scientists say that they found them. Because the information you receive from other people changes over time, your beliefs are always ready to change as well. Now let's make this a bit more practical with sales. If a stranger knocked on my door and tried to sell me a shoe, what would he need to say to convince me to buy it? Like most people, my first instinct would be that I would never buy a shoe from some stranger who's bothering me like this. However, beliefs can easily change. If the stranger told me that he made this shoe by hand for his son 
who recently passed away, I clearly couldn't ignore him at that point. If he then tells me that he came to my door because he saw me earlier and that I remind him of his son, I would then feel a sense of care for this man. Next, he could say that both his son and I seem to have very similar posture problems and that he made the shoe by hand because it would alleviate these posture issues. He could then explain why most commercially made shoes are terrible for your back and how his handmade shoe is exactly tailored for someone with my issue. At that point, I would be curious to see if his product actually works. Lastly, he tells me that he just wants me to try the shoes for a few days for free to see if it could actually help me the way that he hoped it would help his son. And if I like them, I could keep them for just the cost of what it was to make the shoe. If I don't, he'll take them back with no questions asked. He could top it off by saying that the only thing he really wants to know is if this shoe could have helped his late son. By the end of all of this, I would have to be a pretty mean guy to say no. Again, this is a random hypothetical scenario, but these are the sort of mental exercises I did with myself to make sure that I knew how to sell anything. Now, how do you convert this into selling your consulting service? Well, the first step is to recognize that you're more accepting of information from someone if they appear to be credible. Credibility can come from someone's accolades, way of speaking, appearance, positive reviews from others, evidence of results, and so forth. Most people who start a new business try to establish this credibility by building a formal company brand. This is a terrible first move. It requires a tremendous amount of effort, money, and time to build a brand that people know or care about. Plus, you're setting yourself up for people to compare you to better known brands. The smarter thing to do would be to leverage your existing credibility as an individual instead of building a random new brand from scratch. Your LinkedIn profile is one of the best ways to do this. Alternatively, if you prefer having a website, you should make it all about yourself and not some artificial company brand that you invented. When a potential client glances at your background, there are three major credibility points they can extract. The first one is your education. If you went to a great university or studied highly relevant subjects to the service you're providing, you should make that readily visible. Well-regarded universities in particular have a strong brand to leverage. The second one is the companies you've serviced. If your potential clients are similar to any of the companies you've worked for, you should make that as clear as possible. So in my case, my potential clients were startups that had a certain amount of fundraising. I had already worked for startups with that same level of fundraising, but they weren't known brands. So instead of naming these different startups that people may or may not have heard of, I made it clear that I worked for, quote, C to Series B startups, end quote. This verbiage is very clear to my clients. If my target clients were large corporations, I could name the large corporations I worked for. However, if those corporations don't have a strong enough brand for your potential clients, I would instead put down that I worked for Fortune 500 companies because that term on its own does have a great brand associated to it. Last but not least is the exact work you've done. For a potential client, they would like to see that you've been able to successfully do this same service for a similar company in the past. If your background has a range of work that you've done, highlight and refocus it to just the work that's extremely relevant to your potential client. For example, if you've done recruiting and sales in the past, but your potential client just wants you to do sales, then your work experience should heavily highlight the sales work in particular. This isn't so different from how you get a job if you think about it. If you're servicing individuals, your goal would be to show that you've either successfully supported individuals in the past, or that you've accomplished what they would like to accomplish with your own accolades. Now, once you've oriented your LinkedIn profile or website to establish credibility with your potential clients, the next step is to identify which exact companies and people to target. If you're trying to convert your current job into a consulting business, one of the easiest things you could do is look for companies who have posted jobs that you'd be qualified for and initially act like a job candidate. You can find these postings on LinkedIn, AngelList, Indeed, Monster, and many more. Then, you can either formally apply to the job 
or you can do a LinkedIn search to find the hiring manager for the role and message them directly. If these are remote contracting positions, then you're solid. You would just need to go through the standard interview process, or you can offer to work for free for two weeks to bypass the traditional process. If these are full-time positions, then once you get a phone interview with the hiring manager, not the recruiter, you can let them know that you would ideally prefer to work as a contractor and see if that works for them. You want them to want you first before telling them this. I'll go into the exact verbiage to use in a separate session. Moreover, you'll need to do this with a much higher quantity of openings than you're used to as a job candidate because you'll need multiple clients ultimately and you can expect enough of them to say that they only want a full-time person. Now, if this route doesn't make sense for your situation, here's what you would do. For companies that are less than 50 people, you want to focus your efforts on targeting the founders and highest executives. At this stage, they're still making all the decisions. For companies that are more than 50 people, you want to focus your efforts on senior level managers, directors, and VPs within the department that you would be servicing. So how do you find these companies and people? Well, if you're targeting startups, utilize the website AngelList. Under the More section at the top of their website, you can select the Companies button and filter down to your ideal client type. Once you have a list of several hundreds of companies or more available, go into each company profile and select the founder's LinkedIn profile. From there, you can save their profile onto a spreadsheet. If the startup has more than 50 people, Click on the company's LinkedIn profile, go to their employees, and find the appropriate individuals. Ideally, you would be messaging a few people per company. For larger corporations, you would need to do a Google search to find the ones that fit your criteria. For example, if you wanted to target the largest hardware corporations, you would simply run a Google search that says that, and you would end up at a website called hardwaretop100.org. You can go through the same process with software companies, marketing agencies, construction companies, it really doesn't matter. Then you would go on to LinkedIn. Let's say that you wanted to target all the VPs of engineering at Apple. You would simply click on LinkedIn search bar and without typing anything, just click on the magnifying glass icon at the right side of the search bar. Then you would click on the all filters tab on the top right and select their current company and put in VP of engineering for their current title. Then you could go through each profile and save the ones that are appropriate onto a spreadsheet. You can then do the same process with director and senior manager level people at Apple and then move on to the next company. If your target clients are individuals on their own, then do a LinkedIn search purely by what their current job title would be as well as their location. Again, put all the appropriate people's LinkedIn URLs on a spreadsheet. You can also find viable potential clients by joining appropriate groups on LinkedIn and Facebook and then finding other members of that group from there. Facebook has limits on friend requests and cold messages, so it's best if you can find people's LinkedIn profiles. Other alternatives include networking events and advertising. From my experience, these activities need to be extremely well targeted and focused to reach your ideal client or else it can burn a lot of your time and money. For some people, these methods work well because of their service and industry. For me, I haven't found it to be effective enough to warrant the effort or risk. Now, once you have a list of everyone's LinkedIn profiles, you should start by emailing them. This is ideal because it's free and you can reach a lot of companies this way since people will often check all of their work emails. The core way to extract emails is through Chrome extensions like Contact Out, Zen Sourcer and Signal Hire. As of right now, Zen Sourcer is completely free and Contact Out has a long free trial. There are many other alternatives, but you would want to use the free versions for as long as possible. The way it works is that you go onto anyone's LinkedIn profile and one of these Chrome extensions will be able to tell you their emails. This typically has an 80% success rate of extracting the right email, which is more than enough for our purposes. Alternatively, if you're reaching out to startup founders, 
their email address is typically their first name at their company's website domain. You can also try to find or guess the email format for someone based on the company they work for. Once you have a spreadsheet, which includes everyone's names, LinkedIn profiles, and emails, you can either use any free CRM tool to email them in bulk, or you can simply use a Google Sheet extension like GMAS. These tools will allow you to customize the bulk email by at least including each person's name. Out of the ones whose emails bounce, you can either find another viable email address, or you can go on to LinkedIn and add them as a connection. If they accept your connection, you can message them for free. If you already have a premium version of LinkedIn, like Recruit or Corporate, you can just message them without being connected to them, as long as you have in-mail credits available. We've covered a lot, so let's summarize. First, you need to understand that fundamentally, sales is not difficult. You just need to understand what it would take for you to get sold on something, and then reflect that same process onto others. Second, you need to establish credibility. Instead of trying to build out a formal company brand from scratch, leverage your personal background as you always have. Your personal experiences ranging from your education to the companies you've worked for have great brands on their own that you can utilize. Third, you can find the right companies and people to target by treating this as something very similar to a job hunting process. If that's not appropriate for you, then utilize other platforms like AngelList, LinkedIn, and Google to identify who to reach out to and then email or LinkedIn message them accordingly. Tomorrow, we'll go into the exact verbiage you'll need with your messaging and phone conversations for clients to get started with you. Thank you. Hi, today is day six of training. We've gone over a lot already, but we're just getting started. Once you've identified the companies and individuals you're going to target and how you're going to reach out to them, the next step is coming up with the right sales pitch. The first step to this is your written messaging. If you're submitting an email or LinkedIn in-mail, this starts with the subject line. Most people underestimate the impact of a subject line, but this is the sole determinant of whether your message is going to get opened. The biggest mistake you could make is to write a long subject line or give too much detail. You just want this to be a bait so that they can bother to open the rest of the email. There are two forms of subject lines that will work well in this cold outreach situation. The first one is to act as though it's an internal email that they're getting from a colleague. For example, the most common subject line I use is just the word inquiry. If you get an email that says inquiry, it sounds like it could be important, and it's not hard to want to at least open it to see the message. If someone referred me to the person I'm reaching out to, I would just say the words referral from, and then insert the referring person's name. I could also use the subject line with the words follow up. Whichever variation you choose, the point here is to not come across as a marketing email but rather something that's relatively important for them to read without going overboard. The second form of subject lines that work well is leveraging brand names. Oftentimes, you'll have agency recruiters represent an engineering candidate who once worked at Google, and they'll use the subject line Google Engineer to lure in a potential client. You can do this with your own background as well. If I see that a startup is looking to hire a recruiter, I can use the subject line, Head of Talent from Series B Startups, to get them just to be interested in me. I would never use that subject line for a company that isn't a startup because saying that I supported Series B companies might not mean anything to them. This is also why it's critical to target clients that you completely understand. You'll be able to say the right things to bait them. You should ideally have these two variations of subject lines established. Once you do, you can test them out to see which one works better for you. Afterwards, you won't need to really think about this anymore. Next is the actual body of the message. Since this email is unsolicited, there's no reason for someone to read it. Moreover, people actively try to skip messages that aren't coming from someone they know or have heard of. 
So how do you bypass this problem? The first thing to do is to keep it short. An initial email should never be more than five sentences. The shorter it is, the more likely someone is to read all of it. And five sentences should be enough to get your message across. The second key is to make sure that each sentence lures in people to read the next sentence. This only happens if each sentence adds a lot of value to the reader. So let's begin. You always start the email with the word hi and then the person's name. If you send a mass email without including each person's first name, they'll assume that it's a mass marketing email. If you don't know the person you're emailing because you're sending it to a generic inbox, then it's okay to address it to the company name, but it'll be a lot more impactful if you can find and mention the name of the person you're trying to reach out to because it can often get forwarded to them. Then, for the first sentence, you need to make it emotionally appealing and valuable. I usually say, love your background at whatever the company name is, and I'm glad we're connected. Me saying that I love their background is an emotional appeal, and mentioning the company name implies that I took the time to look into them. Then, by saying that we're connected, I'm implying that I'm not a stranger to them. You could also make this more detailed by, by saying, I love that you founded XYZ Company, and I saw that we both know XYZ people. Those XYZ people can just be mutual connections you found on LinkedIn. You can also pick any other things in common between you and this person, like your education, work experience, hobbies, and so forth. Most of this can be found by looking at their LinkedIn profile. The goal here is to make sure that the recipient of the email doesn't pattern match you to typical marketing emails. It should seem as though a genuine individual took the time to message them. If you need to message a mass quantity of people, then at least include their first name at the beginning, which you can set up as a spreadsheet column on GMAS or any CRM tool for your mass messaging. And then, have separate messages that are specific to each bucket of companies that you're reaching out to, and it'll make it seem a lot more personalized to each recipient. You can bucket the companies out by industry, funding, location, services, and so forth. For the second sentence, there needs to be a significant hook. Doing this in the form of a question is usually the most powerful. Moreover, you want the implied answer to your question to be yes. The one I use is, can I work for you for free? Other variations can be, would you like to interview engineers from Google and Uber? Or, does your sales team need more bandwidth? Create your own that specifically works for your situation and industry. But regardless, it has to be extremely compelling to read the next sentence at the very least. So how do you make sure that you write the right message? This is where the realization I mentioned in the last video of how sales is easy kicks in. All you need to do is imagine that you're in the recipient's shoes and you get this random email from someone you don't know. To make things easier to comprehend for you, write out your message as though it's addressed to you. So I'll actually write my first draft by saying, Hi Arvid, I love your background as a head of talent and I'm glad we both know Jamie Carricker. Can I work for you for free? This is a really exciting message for me to receive already, so I know that if I convert this to my potential clients that I'm reaching out to, he or she will like it as well. If this message was just good, then there's a decent chance that the potential client's annoyance over receiving an unsolicited email will make it a net negative, and they'll just close the email. So write the message as though you're receiving it yourself, and make sure that it's extraordinary. Now let's keep going to the third sentence. At this point, you've gotten them to be interested in learning what's going on and who you are. In my case, I'll say that I've been the head of talent for major SF startups and I'm growing my own recruiting firm now. I say the first part because it implies that I'm completely competent in doing recruiting work for companies that are similar to them. I say the second part because it starts to explain why I'm willing to work for free for them or why I reached out in the first place. You can do the same thing with your own situation. So the first sentence could read, 
I've been leading digital marketing at Google and I'm growing my own marketing agency now. Or I've been the highest grossing sales executive at a Fortune 500 company and I'm now growing my own sales consulting practice. No matter what your background is, the first part of the sentence should be the flashiest way to explain your experience that they would understand. This leads me to the fourth sentence. If you're going to provide a free trial, then you say, quote, I'd love to do completely free work for you to develop my business, end quote. If you're not, then you can say that I'd love to work for you at a fraction of the price as anyone else to develop my business. Whatever it is, it needs to sound like a great deal for them and it needs to make sense as to why you're doing it. Otherwise, they'll think that they're going to get burned. The last sentence is a call to action that makes life easy for your client. I would typically say, do you have just five minutes to chat anytime this week? Or, can I meet you at your office for just five minutes anytime today? Now obviously, your meeting or phone call will end up being closer to 30 minutes, but this is a gesture of what you're willing to do. Also, you want to make things convenient for them, so go with any time or date that they prefer. Again, at this point, they still hold all the cards. Lastly, I would say something like, Best Arvid, or Thank you, Arvid, but never include a bunch of little writing underneath, especially logos or company names. These will make it seem like a marketing message was sent. Instead, you can include your LinkedIn URL underneath so that they can see how great and suitable your background is. If you're not getting a response, there are several things you can do. The first thing is the timing of your message. If you send an email during the middle of the day when someone is busy, the odds that they'll bother to respond will go down heavily. Also, the day of the week matters a lot. Most people don't try to get into more work on Fridays or over the weekend. The best thing you could do is send the message to them late at night or early in the morning from Monday to Wednesday. This way, the email will be at the top of their list and they'll be far more likely to read it and take action. Next, you need to make sure to send a follow-up email. People will often get emails that they actually like, but they're too busy to manage that conversation at the moment. The best follow-up emails tend to be a few days after the first email, and it should just be a simple message saying something like, Hi, first name. I just wanted to follow up. Please let me know if you're free to meet anytime today or tomorrow. Thank you, Arvid. You can also include something like, I can only work with one final client, so I'd love to speak with you as soon as possible. This would create a level of urgency if they actually are interested in what you would provide. Sometimes you'll see people send a significant amount of follow-up messages. The risk with that is that too many people could start marking your emails as spam, and then you'll automatically go into other people's spam folders. If you really want to send an additional message, go onto their LinkedIn profile, make a connection request, and then send them a separate message there. Additionally, you need to make sure that you're messaging the right people. Oftentimes, you may have sent it to someone who's at a very high level in the company, so they're too busy to entertain these requests. So if they're not responding after your follow-up, go back to the company's LinkedIn profile, find the current employees, and find other suitable people to email. Last and most important is quantity. The reality of the situation is that you're sending messages to people who don't know you personally. You're not aware of their current situation, their mood, how their company is doing, how much they actually need you at the moment, or how much of a budget they truly have. When you do your best to narrow things down to the types of individuals or companies that are ideal for you, that saves you a mass amount of time and hassle. However, you still have a notable amount of unknown because you're generalizing. The only way to make up for this is through quantity. High quantity is the single most powerful tool in business. That's why spam mail and garbage messages haven't gone away. On average, I found that rich people tend to be less intelligent than most of the people I know. However, the reason they're rich is because they're extremely persistent.
For example, 10 incredible reach outs with even a 20% conversion rate means two clients at the end of the day. On the other hand, 10,000 reach outs with a 1% conversion means 100 clients. Quantity wins in business, but most academically smart people do a very small amount of quantity and only focus on high quality. Hence, you should still be sending messages that are definitely very good, but don't ever spend a bunch of time for any particular potential client when it comes to reaching out. Only focus your time on them once they've responded. The same advice applies if you're taking the job application approach to acquiring clients. At the bare minimum, you should be applying to 100 jobs per week. If your rebuttal to all of this is that there aren't that many of your ideal clients out there, I would disagree. It's very likely that there are more than enough of your ideal clients to begin with, but you may not have found the extensive list of them yet, or you're jumping to conclusions without exhausting your options. If you're certain that you've maxed things out, then here's what you would do. If your ideal clients are large corporations, then break down each corporation by department and treat each department as a separate potential client. Then, broaden out your market slightly. If you're stuck thinking that your ideal clients are tech companies that are in the Fortune 100, then broaden out to the Fortune 500, then the Fortune 1000. If you run out of big tech companies, then focus on medium-sized tech companies or big tech departments at a large non-tech company. Use your common sense to make sure that you're branching out appropriately. If your ideal clients are individuals, then it's pretty much a guarantee that you'll have more than enough people who could use your service. So let's summarize everything for today. Your sales pitch begins with your written message. When you send an email or LinkedIn message, your goal is to continuously bait the recipient into reading each line. By the end of it, there should be a call to action that makes their lives easy. If you're not getting the results you want, then it's likely a result of poor timing, a lack of following up, poor targeting, or not enough quantity. It's persistence, not intellect, that wins in business. That's it for today. Tomorrow, we're going to dive deep into the sales pitch you should use on the phone and in person to close the deal. So stay tuned. Thank you. Hi, welcome to day seven of our training. Regardless of which route you take with client acquisition, you'll always end up closing the deal through in-person or phone conversations. Getting this right is absolutely critical, so take diligent notes on everything we're going to cover today. There's a common teaching in sales, which is to ask a lot of questions at first to understand a potential customer's pain point. My philosophy is different. If you don't already know their pain points beforehand, you're not targeting the right people. Also, if you've ever been asked a bunch of questions by a salesperson, you'll know how quickly this can feel annoying. You need to establish extreme credibility and rapport from the beginning. Some people are actually able to do this through a line of high quality questions. However, it's a lot easier to control the situation with your own pitch. So I'm going to go through my own pitch to potential clients and dissect it for you. My success rate with it is 100%. Any potential client that has the money for my services has said yes after hearing it. So let's go through it. The first step is researching the person you're going to be talking to. Let's imagine I'm going to talk to a guy named Andy, who's a founder of a startup with 30 employees, $7 million in funding, is based in San Francisco, and his personal background tells me that he went to a top university, used to be an engineer for large companies, and then he decided to create this tech startup two years ago. This gives me all the context I'll need because I understand people in this situation very well. For them, hiring engineers is a massive pain point because they want to hire the best engineers in Silicon Valley, but they're competing against all these other well-known tech startups that can pay much higher salaries. So people in a situation often don't get any qualified applicants and they resort to spending an arm and a leg on outside services or platforms that will introduce them to better candidates. Looking at his personal background, 
I'm sure he's also frustrated by the fact that most recruiters don't understand his exact requirements for engineering candidates because recruiters aren't engineers themselves. Lastly, he has the context of working at a large company where recruiting is often a well-oiled machine, so I'm sure he's confused about why it's so hard for him to do this with his own startup. With this context at hand, my narrative is solidified. We're going to go through this line by line. At first, I'll give him a call and say, hi, is this Andy? And he'll say, yes, is this Arvid? To which I'll say, yeah, thank you for taking the time to chat. Is now still a good time for you? Then he says, yeah, now is great. And then I go, I actually want to give you an overview of my background and the services I provide, and then we can chat about whether that's aligned to what you're looking for. Does that sound good? And then he'll say, yeah, sounds great. So then I go into my pitch. I say, okay, perfect. So I actually have a pretty technical background myself. I originally grew up doing engineering since the age of 12 because my dad thought that Java was the future. And then I ended up graduating with a degree in applied math by the age of 19. Let's pause here. Why did I open by saying this? There are several reasons. First, I want him to see me as an individual, not some formal company he's talking to. So I'm going to go into my own background and build rapport that way. Second, I specifically talked about my engineering experience because he's been an engineer himself and he can no longer pattern match me to the typical recruiter who hasn't ever done anything technical. Next, I mentioned that it was since the age of 12 and that my dad thought that Java was the future. I did this because I wanted to build an imagery into the story and some humor because he can likely relate to this in some way. The young age aspect also makes it so that it sounds like I properly understand engineering, but I haven't actually done it in a while, so he wouldn't be testing me on anything. And then, I went into the fact that I graduated at the age of 19 with a degree in applied math. This is purely to impress him and to establish even more credibility. For anyone who's done a math or engineering degree, there's always at least one genius at the university who's graduating at a really young age. I just graduated early because I was motivated out of a distaste towards school growing up, so I'm really not that genius type of person at all. But I wanted him to mentally map me to that kind of individual. Let's keep going with the pitch. Next, I say, then I started working at Fortune 500 companies and ended up getting into startups. And immediately I saw a massive difference between recruiting at a large company versus recruiting at a startup. At a large company, they're often hiring for roles that they've been hiring for, for many years. So at that point, they just need enough people and systems in place to repeat the process that's been proven to work. At a startup, on the other hand, it's not a solved problem. Most of the time, you're hiring for new roles that you haven't ever hired for before. Or even if you did make hires into that role, it usually came through an ad hoc way, either as a referral or through some other random source. So let's pause here. I didn't sit around asking about his pain point. I already knew them and I just expressed that I'm competent enough to already recognize what he's been experiencing. This builds a massive amount of rapport. Every sentence is deliberate because it plays to his background at large companies and now his current difficulty with running his own company. For a company of his size, age and location, there's virtually no way that I'm wrong about what I'm saying. I know this client type extremely well. So let's move on. Next, I'll say, so there's a figuring out process of how to consistently hire the right person for each new type of role. And that's exactly my expertise. I did it as the head of talent for a series B startup that had 40 people when I joined and I got them to over 100 people within six months on my own. This encompassed engineering, sales, customer success, and operations. Okay, so why did I say this? By claiming that my expertise happens to be solving their exact niche problem, I proclaimed myself to be the best person they can readily have to resolve this pain point. And then I backed it up with amazing evidence by showing how many hires I got for a similar size company in a short period of time by myself. More or less, 
They should be feeling like I'm the answer to their prayers at this point. So let's keep going. I'll then say that over the past year, I've been exclusively focused on helping startups that are less than 100 people, and ideally less than 50 people, because that tends to be the most challenging phase for hiring. So that's exactly my favorite. And with all the different clients I've had, we've been able to successfully reach all of their hiring goals. Through these experiences, I found that there are two core areas that I can make the biggest impact with recruiting. The first one is with sourcing really great candidates to get them through the door. And the second one is closing those candidates since oftentimes numerous companies want the same people. The point of me saying this is to transition myself from only being a successful employee to now being an expert at working in a consulting format with the companies that are extremely similar to them in their heads. And I support that with a piece of strong evidence. Then I mentioned that there are two core areas that are the most useful for them because I honestly don't want to do all the other work they could have me doing. So up front, they're agreeing to the logic of why I should only focus on just two activities and how that makes the biggest impact for them. Next, I want to go into explaining the compensation piece. However, I want to give them a bit of a breather and let them feel like they ask me questions. So I'll simply say, so that's the general summary on my side, and I'd love to see if you have any questions and how this aligns to what you're looking for. Inevitably, one of the only questions that they can come up with is, so what is your compensation structure? To that I respond by saying, yeah, that's a great question. So since we haven't worked together before, I'd love to work for you for free for the next two weeks just to prove myself to you. The first week is dedicated to onboarding, and by the second week, you should see better candidates than you've ever seen throughout your company. That's my goal and guarantee. And after that, I want this to be far cheaper than any alternative possible. So most recruiting agencies and consultants charge an arm and a leg for a very little value that they bring. But I can support your highest priority roles for just 6K a month. And there are no commitments or contracts. You can just cancel at any point. Now, if your potential client is coming in as a referral, or if they reach out to you first, then there's no need to do a free trial. You can just say the second half of what I mentioned. But let's break down what I said and why. I mentioned that I would prove myself because I don't want them to waste time asking for references or have me get approved by a bunch of people. I then make a claim about a significant outcome they should see by the second week because that should compel them to see if what I'm saying will really come true. By the way, it always comes true for me because I know I can send them some amazing candidates by week two, but I'm not necessarily saying that we're going to hire these people so quickly. So come up with a significant outcome you can provide, but not necessarily the end outcome, just a notable step that would make them very happy with the progress. Next, I chose a frame of reference that would make my service affordable in their eyes. In reality, I could have compared myself to recruiting platforms or outsourced labor that's cheap, but I chose to compare myself to the most expensive common alternatives. And then I undercut their price by 50 to 70%. Again, in reality, I'll make more money than those alternatives charge because I'm getting a flat fee over many months. I conclude it by saying that there are no commitments or contracts because I want things to feel de-risked for them and I want a very casual process to get started as soon as possible. Time kills all deals. Now besides answering one or two clarifying questions on how exactly I do my service, the one thing left for me to say is that I only have the capacity to take on one more client right now, so I'm glad we got on the phone. Since it's a free trial, I always get started the next day with any startup. So what that would look like is for us to do an onboarding call tomorrow where I would get all of your requirements for the role and then I'll curate a list of candidates to get your feedback on. And if the easiest way to communicate with you is through Slack, then you can just add me on there and we can get going. Let's break down this verbiage. I said that I can only take on one final client to imply scarcity and a bit of a rush. Next. I said that I always get started the next day because I'm establishing that it's the norm for companies similar to his own to immediately begin the engagement. You would be surprised by how powerful this is. 
I then clarify the next interaction we're going to have and why. By setting it for a time that's as soon as possible, this in effect will properly begin the engagement. Lastly, I ask to get onto their Slack channel. That's an internal messaging tool for a company, so you should feel like I'm more a part of the team already this way. Now, if there's no free trial in your case, then I would set up the onboarding call and let them know that I'll send the invoice as well. Don't wait around to create and sign contracts. In this situation, a contract has zero benefit for you and all of the benefit goes to them. The reason is that if you're getting paid up front for each month of service, then what commitment would you possibly need to hold them to? If anything, they're assuming the risk by paying you up front, but they should be willing to do so if they feel like they're getting a massive bargain. Some companies do ask for a contract, in which case you can send them a one-page independent contractor agreement through DocuSign, and that can just cover the basics like start date, compensation amount, and invoice payment date. But never let the signing of this contract hold you up. I've had several clients ask for a contract and they never got around to signing it, but we ended up working together for many months without anyone remembering. If the call on its own isn't sufficient to close the deal, then your next step would be to meet in person. If you're dealing with larger companies, this will be inevitable. But nothing changes in terms of how you sell them. For in-person meetings, they'll often have you meet with multiple people. You need to do all of your homework on each person you're going to meet and play to their background as much as possible during your conversations. I'll give one particular example. There was a very fast growing popular startup that I was talking to. The only issue was that they were extremely scattered internally. So the first person I talked to on the phone loved everything I had to say. Since she wasn't the sole decision maker, she asked me to meet with the co-founder of the company in person. The co-founder happened to be a lawyer, so I talked more about my legal background with him and we had a great time going over why both of us are where we are today. But that single commonality made that entire conversation beautiful. I thought that was it because it went so well, but then he informed me that they recently hired a VP of people, so I would need to chat with her because I'd be directly working with her. Eventually, I get a meeting set up with her and then on the calendar invite, I noticed that there are three other people coming to that meeting. Trust me, selling to four totally different people at the same time in a small room isn't easy. However, it worked out because I studied every single person's background. I addressed all of our commonalities and I spent time focusing on each individual and I kept my narrative consistent. But again, I knew that this company was very slow to get started, so I needed to take things into my own hands. I ended up sending them a spreadsheet of nearly 100 amazing engineering candidates that night so they could feel a sense of urgency to get started with me. Sure enough, we did. So let's recap everything. Don't waste your time asking a bunch of questions during the sales pitch. You should already know their pain points. Plus, you can learn more about their company and requirements after they're completely on board with working with you. Next. Each sentence in your sales pitch should be extremely deliberate. It should either have the purpose of addressing their pain point, establishing your credibility, or closing the deal. Lastly, you should tailor it to the background of the person you're pitching to. That's everything for this week. I know I gave you a lot to digest, so it's crucial that you apply it as soon as possible to your own situation. The people who have already had a lot of success with this training already have been applying things immediately. So don't wait. Next week, we're going to dive into pricing so that you can ideally get 50K per month quickly, regardless of your service. I'll also go into the nuances of forming your company, invoicing, and contracts so that you're well set up on the back end. Thank you. Hi, welcome to week three of our training. Now that you have the foundation for acquiring clients, we're going to go into pricing. I've spent years building my expertise on this topic specifically because of how important it is to starting and sustaining a business. So let's get going. The first question to determine pricing is your client's ability to pay. Two factors go into this. The first one is the cash they have available after all of their typical expenses. This cash can come from a combination of their revenue, 
fundraising, and debt. Since you'd be charging them monthly, it makes sense to think of the cash they have on hand each month. For clients that are individuals, this is usually from their personal income and a small amount of debt. So if your typical clients are middle to upper middle class individuals, you can just roughly estimate a maximum of a few hundred dollars to a thousand dollars freely available in a given month after their expenses. For clients that are startups, cash primarily comes from fundraising and revenue. So let's say they have five million dollars raised with a million dollars of annual income coming in. That may seem like a good amount of money, but the cost of their employees, office space, marketing, legal, accounting, and everything else you could think of would go into the several millions per year. So a startup at this stage would likely have less than 100K freely available each month after all their common expenses. For larger corporations, cash is mostly a combination of revenue and some debt. They may have hundreds of millions freely available, but this isn't usually up for anyone to take. That brings me to the second factor in determining your client's ability to pay. And that is the predetermined amount they're willing to allocate to your services. This is extremely dependent on their current needs. So if I'm selling recruiting services, how much of someone's free cash they're willing to spend on recruiting is going to depend on how important recruiting is to them at this time. Out of that available amount, you would need to minus how much they're already allocating to other tools or services to solve this need. A common issue with dealing with large companies as clients is that although they may have a lot of money, they typically utilize well-branded services already, and that's how their budget gets allocated. Moreover, in a large corporation setting, there has to be quite a lot of justification through numerous people to work with your business as opposed to others. The way around this is to subcontract through the well-branded vendors they're already working with. These well-branded vendors typically have a process for working with small businesses to reduce their own costs. You could also just try to acquire a remote contracting job that they have publicly available. In that case, the company has already made an approved internal decision to hire someone remotely as a contractor. And after proving yourself as a remote contractor, you can offer to take on more work. So the pricing opportunity here comes from the abundance of work available after demonstrating your value. In a startup context, how much they're willing to spend is proportional to how difficult it is for them to do it themselves. If it's easy, then why spend the money? If it's a pain point, then they'll start to spend a larger percentage of their available cash. But competition is actually more limited than you would imagine because it makes more sense for successful vendors to target companies with a higher budget. So it's very doable to get several thousands each month from a startup. With individuals, they don't have much money to begin with, so your service must be filling a significant pain point or it would have to be extremely affordable. So let's summarize this. The first step to determining pricing is to have a complete comprehension on how much cash your potential client likely has available, and out of that cash, what percentage they're willing to allocate to your services specifically. In calculating this, you need to account for whether they're already paying for other services it's not ideal to get into a competitive environment with a business. So let's do the numbers for me. My ideal clients are startups that have raised five to $25 million. Since that's still a wide range, I would segment it into the five to 10 million bucket, the 10 to 20 million bucket, and the 20 to 25 million bucket. So for the five to 10 million bucket, let's guess that they have $100,000 freely available each month after their typical expenses. Out of that 100K, they can choose to do a lot of things with that. For recruiting specifically, they probably already pay for certain software platforms and a commission fee on hires that come through outside agencies. So in order to build a long-term relationship, I would need to feel like an insignificant cost to them. So as a starting point, I should aim to charge less than 10% of that available cash. That's also assuming that hiring is a notable pain point for them because other people aren't successfully servicing them already. For larger companies, I would just look at how much they're willing to pay an employee for the same work in order to get an estimate of what I can charge. Once you're clear on your client's financial constraints, the next question is your own constraints. This boils down to the amount of hours you can reasonably work 
and your basic expenses. So let's say you can work up to 10 hours in a day and your expenses are $5,000 a month. Once you break things down, you see that you can do all the work a particular client needs within five hours a day. That means that you need each client to pay you a minimum of $2,500 a month. That's your lower limit. Now this number will adjust over time because you'll be able to service clients more efficiently and you'll pick clients that are less of a hassle to deal with. In my case, I went from spending four hours a day on each client to only spending four hours a week on them over time. This happened through a combination of leveraging interns, narrowing down my services, and choosing more ideal clients. So don't worry about being stuck working too much for a certain amount of pay. Being a remote contractor who charges monthly instead of hourly is the savior to all this. Now, sticking with my hypothetical scenario of clients that have raised five to $10 million with 100K of monthly extra cash and a ceiling of 10% to charge on that cash, that leads me to charging between 2.5K and 10K per month per client. You can get to the upper end of this range pretty quickly if you can demonstrate enough value to your client through the initial work you do. But to get started, it's best to aim for something closer to the middle. The reason is that you don't want them to avoid initiating things with you just because of a high price. If you charge something too low, you can run the risk of not being able to cover your monthly expenses if something does go wrong with one of your other clients. So in my case, let's shoot for 6K per month per client. Don't just copy this number, by the way. It needs to make sense for your situation. If you're servicing smaller businesses, the number might be 1K per month or even less. There's nothing wrong with that as long as the amount of hours per client is minimized. Conversely, you can be charging 15K per month per client, but you want to be careful about spending all of your time on that single client. So how do I get a prospective client to pay me 6K per month? Well, the most important principle in pricing is psychological anchoring. The truth is that no one can tell what something should cost unless if they have something else to compare it to. That's one of the main reasons Apple had always focused on branding and design as its differentiator. If you look at their computers in the past, it was hard to mentally compare them to other computers out there because they seem notably different. So once that pattern interrupt is established in a consumer's mind, you need to control the narrative of what they do end up comparing you to. In Apple's case, they just had you compare prices between all of their computers. Based on that, you would pick the computer that felt like it was the best deal for you. This is the basis of tiered pricing. Whenever you see numerous models and pricing options of a product, it's not really because there are so many people who want these variations of options. It's more of a way for you to feel like you're getting a great deal for the option you pick. Most commonly, it's designed for 80% of people to pick one particular option. A way to do this is to have the cheapest option barely have the essential features you need. The priciest option have unnecessary features and the option in the middle to be closer priced to the cheaper option, but it has the real features you want. In our case with consulting, it doesn't make as much sense to provide a suite of prices to start because you're trying to provide as much value as you possibly can to establish rapport with your client and you don't want to act like a formal business. Over time, you can present these different options once you have your company operating like a machine. So what do you do instead? You need to compare yourself to options that are far more than what you're charging. That will be the psychological anchor. So one way to do that is to actually compare it to how much you would normally charge to do the same work as an employee. With that route, just be careful not to come across as bragging. It should be more of a way to show that other companies pay people X amount for these services, but you think that this client should get that same value at a fraction of the price. Now the safest alternative is to compare yourself to other services that they have heard of or considered. Comparing yourself to things that they don't know about doesn't have the same impact. So in my case, I can compare myself to recruiting agencies that charge 20% per hire. Most of the roles I hire for pay around $150,000 in annual salary. That equates to $30,000 per hire. 
And these companies are hoping to make one hire per month. So when I make this comparison in their head, that route equates to up to 30K per month. On a side note, in reality, half of all hires tend to come from referrals and the other half are scattered amongst different sources. So the odds of them making a hire through me separately might be one out of five hires if I'm great at what I do, which would ultimately be $30,000 for five months of effort with one particular startup. This would equal $6,000 a month. The only problem with that is that it's not guaranteed that I'll make any hires with this client. So it's much smarter to attain the 6K per month as a flat upfront rate. Moreover, when I act as an internal resource for them who's responsible for attaining their hiring goals, regardless of how it happens, they'll attribute every hire to me in some way because I will have played a hand in it. The next comparison I'll make is to other consulting firms or consultants. They typically charge a high hourly rate or monthly rate on a long-term contract. This implies that the client needs to take on a notable risk to work with them and it's more expensive than hiring a full-time employee. Again, on a side note, these consulting firms and consultants aren't smart about what they're doing. Because they're charging such a high rate, they tend to need to allocate a lot of resources to servicing that one client. Particularly if you're an individual consultant, it'll be harder to make your work completely remote or simplified enough to completely delegate it to someone else at this high of a price point. Hence, you're prevented from growing your business. This was actually a big mistake I made in the early days. In exchange for a higher price, I had to commit a lot more face time with the company. This made it really difficult to find the time to automate things and grow my business. Lastly, the final price comparison I'll make is to them paying a full-time employee. If you see that they have a job opening to get this work done, you can directly refer to its salary range. Or you can refer to what's typical for similar companies to pay an employee for this work. And then you present yourself as a much better option by saying that you focus on the most important tasks that would need to get done so that you can be far more productive than you would even be as an employee doing this. Plus, it's a major discount on that employee price tag. So overall, the point here is to compare yourself to something more expensive and then show how that more expensive option is actually far worse than what they can get from you. That's what makes it a no-brainer for them to say yes. If the potential client were to ever compare me to a cheaper option, I would either present how that cheaper option provides little to no value, or I would angle myself as something different enough to where that cheaper option supplements what I do, so they would need to have both. Which route I take with my argument would just depend on how bought in they are already to their alternative. Now, getting 6K per month per client is my target to start. However, it's important to be flexible to get a deal done if someone is a good potential client. Oftentimes, they'll either say that they can't pay that much right now or drag things along because of the price. When that happens, I would just say that I really want to work with them because I like them a lot so I can bring the price down to just 4K per month. And that's the cheapest I've ever offered. If that's still too much for them, I personally know that I can bring down the price to the bare minimum of 2.5K a month, but my willingness to bring the price down is correlated to how many other viable opportunities are available to me at that time. If I can easily get a client to pay me closer to 6K per month, then it's not worth it. Regardless, you should keep a close relationship because soon enough, it won't take much of your time to service each client, so you would be able to bring the cost down. If all of this is too much analysis for you, again, the simplest way to do things is to find an open job opportunity you're qualified for, apply to that, and then offer to be a contractor, as we mentioned before. Then you say that you'll do it for 20% less than what they're going to pay a full-time person. However, you still need to do a thorough analysis on your costs and time spent per client to understand the minimum you need to bring in per client. If you're targeting individuals as clients, then the price you should charge should be notably less than what you would expect someone to charge if you were in the customer's shoes. You still go through the same process of making comparisons to them using alternative services, but your price should be at a rate that they're comfortable paying for many months. 
The other thing to keep in mind is how much time you're servicing each individual. Remember that you have the freedom to service them in groups when possible. So to summarize everything today, figure out the upper limit of what you can charge based on the types of clients you're targeting. Then analyze the lower limit based on your own constraints. Once you have that range, target for a monthly cost that's somewhere in the middle and convince a potential client to pay you that by comparing yourself to something a lot more expensive. There will still be some trial and error with the price, but be flexible enough not to lose a viable client over it. Hi, welcome to week four of our training. It's crazy how time is flying by. So this week, we're gonna dive into the fun stuff. Let's start with your initial client relationship. If you're providing a free trial, you need to have a goal of a 100% conversion rate from free to paid. There are only two reasons why you wouldn't get that outcome. The first one is that you did a poor job picking the right type of client. And the second one is that you didn't emotionally impact them. So I'll take you through several scenarios that'll cover all the variations of what could happen. Let's start with the most ideal one. One evening, I was meeting with the founder who responded to my free trial reach out email and offered to chat in person. When I did my research on him, I saw that he had some of the most famous investors in the world behind him because he came up with something that no one thought to do in the history of finance. Through his creativity, he became a billionaire from scratch in two years at the age of 30. He also taught himself concepts like machine learning to the point where he was among the top experts in the world. He also had several PhD level financial mathematicians working under him, but he knew more than them just by teaching himself. To say the least, I was intimidated over the idea of meeting with him because I didn't prepare as much as I should have, and I didn't think I could impress him. So I met with the guy, gave him the pitch that you all now know, and by the end of it, he was at a loss of words. He immediately asked if I could join his company as a full-time employee and kept asking for any advice that I had on growing his business. He was willing to pay me up to 30K a month to work with him exclusively. I told him that I'm focused on my consulting business, but that I do want to work closely with him. So to convince me further, he then invited me to come meet his family at his house because they were visiting. I obviously didn't become his employee, but a day later, we began our consulting engagement at 15K per month without a free trial. Even though I was getting paid immediately to start, I still treated it like a trial because I didn't prove my work output to him yet. I also had no intention of messing things up with this client in particular. So I asked what his hiring goals are, and he told me that he urgently needed a person for one particular role. At first, I was doing what I would normally would do in supporting a client and started reaching out and interviewing a bunch of candidates. But then I decided to go above and beyond and I convinced a friend of mine who would be perfect for this role to quit his job and join this company instead. I accomplished this in a matter of two weeks. To put things into perspective, they were unsuccessful at hiring anyone for this role for three to four months before I came in. They were shocked by my results to say the least. I have many more stories with this client, but we'll pause there. So how did I get from giving a free trial offer to them instead immediately paying me way more than any other client ever had. Well, first, I picked the right client. He's a generous person, his company has enough money, and they really needed my services. If even one of those ingredients were missing, it wouldn't work out. I also understood the experiences his company was going through because I already worked with similar stage startups in San Francisco. So in all ways, he was my ideal client. Second, I made a notable emotional impact on him. My pitch hit every chord in his body, and he liked me enough on a personal level that he wanted me to see his family while they were in town. Even more importantly, the results I produced amplified these emotions. I was willing to do whatever it took to shock them in the best way possible. So let's go through a second hypothetical where things generally worked out, but it wasn't as easy. There was this one company that was oddly against ever meeting up in person. I did my first phone call with their VP of product and he was completely on board with starting the trial after the call. I offered to meet in person for our next sync up, but he said he preferred to do it on the phone. So I went ahead with getting his requirements and I started reaching out to appropriate candidates. 
After I was sending candidates his way, I expected him to want to finally sync up thoroughly. But instead, the most I got out of him would be a text message a day or two after as a response. This made it really difficult to calibrate on what he actually wanted, but I did my best to send the most ideal candidates possible. Towards the end of the two weeks, I offered to meet in person again, but he just ignored that and said to do a phone call. On the call, he mentions that he's happy to continue with the engagement, but he needed to have the CEO's approval. It took two more weeks of pestering him via text message until the CEO finally paid the invoice for us to get started. We actually were successful with hiring the person they needed for their open role, but to this day, I've never seen them in person. Their office is about one mile away from where I live. And needless to say, my engagement with them didn't last that long since they needed to put a pause on all hiring in general. So what happened here? First of all, I didn't pick exactly the right client. The VP of product was generous and the company had enough money, but their need for my services clearly wasn't that severe. This became obvious to me once I saw that they didn't need to hire any more people. If they were more desperate for the work I provided, of course they would have met me in person. Secondly, the emotional impact was minimal. There was only so much I could do without building rapport in person and not having the information I needed to wow them with my output during the free trial. Now, at the same time, it wasn't bad. I still gave them better candidates than they were used to getting, and he clearly liked my pitch enough to immediately begin a trial. So the root of the issue really goes back to the fact that I went after a client who didn't have a significant need for my services. At the end of the day, these levers were sufficient enough to convert the trial to paid, but this is not what you would generally want. Now let's go through an example of when things didn't work out. There was one company who had a famous CEO in Silicon Valley. More importantly to me, that CEO was best friends with a globally renowned businessman who happened to be my biggest idol. So as you could imagine, I wanted this company as a client just so that I could get close to these individuals. I ended up meeting with their CTO and he wanted to work with me, but he didn't exactly agree to do a free trial. The reason being is that he felt like they could handle hiring on their own at that stage. But nevertheless, he was curious to see what I could provide. So I kept going over to their office over the span of two weeks just to have conversations and do brainstorming sessions with their CTO. But again, he never agreed to actually do a trial with me. To be frank, this CTO was also one of the most annoying people I've ever had to deal with. I'm sure he's amazing at his line of work, but he lacked some common sense and clear communication skills. So I could tell that this was clearly a waste of my time, but I was desperate to become close to their CEO. Eventually, I got to the point where I just acted like it was a trial and started doing real work output to see if that would convince them. But instead, the miscommunication between me and their CTO led to a significant misunderstanding with what they really needed. All in all, I wasted a month trying to convert this client and I didn't really make the decision to quit on them until one day I learned that the CEO I wanted to get close to was never actually around at the office. He just flies around the world all the time. So all this effort was more or less pointless. Now what happened here? Well, the company did have a lot of money, but the CTO was actually quite frugal and their need for my services wasn't that severe. This made them a terrible client for me to target. And to his credit, he never actually agreed to do a trial. I was just blinded by my goal to be a few steps closer to knowing my idol. Also, I didn't make a significant emotional impact on the CTO. It was sufficient enough for him to want to continue to talk to me, but the two of us just didn't have any chemistry. There was constant misunderstandings and miscommunication. And when that happens with any relationship between two people, it's hard for warm fuzzy feelings to be the result. So how do you avoid these mistakes? Determining if a company has money can be researched beforehand. Determining if a company has a significant need for your services can be partially figured out through research. But to really confirm that and make sure that the person you're going to engage with isn't frugal, you would need to filter that out during the initial conversation. This comes from expressing how much you charge at the end of the pitch and hearing their reaction, as well as double checking their goals over the next several months if they don't proactively tell you. If they check these boxes, 
then the next step is to guarantee that you've amazed them with your service during the trial. So let's go through each step of the trial phase. And by the way, as you saw from my first example, even if you get paid immediately without a trial because a client loves you, is a referral, or came inbound, you would still do these exact same steps to make sure that they have the most optimal initial engagement. This is what will set you up for having them as a long-term client. So day one starts with an onboarding kickoff call or in-person conversation. There are two goals for this. The first one is to get all the necessary information you'll need to start being productive for them. This looks like asking them all the specifics on the type of candidate they want to interview and hire. The answers more or less comes from a series of five standard questions and only takes a half hour. This is enough for me to get into the next phase of my work. But when you're just getting started as a consultant, it would be more ideal for you to go into the office and spend several hours getting more info from several people if possible. Don't risk not getting enough information to do your work effectively. The second goal for this is to have them onboard you onto their systems. So ideally, even during the conversation, they'll add you to Slack, their software tools, and give you a company email. I'll always convince clients to do this by saying that this will be the fastest way for me to be productive and communicate. I also acted like it wasn't a big deal at all to get added to their systems because how else would I be able to do my job? It just felt like a quick standard thing to do, and I would say that this is what I do with all my clients. Again, the reason you want them to add you to this stuff is to psychologically tie you more into their ecosystem as a company. You also want them to agree on clear next steps, particularly on what the next 48 hours will look like. So after the onboarding session, I found it to be extremely effective to calibrate further through sample work. For me, that looked like creating a Google spreadsheet of, say, 30 sample candidate profiles based on the requirements from the conversation and getting feedback on them. I would create this list by the end of the same night of the onboarding conversation and try to get feedback by the second day. The faster this process got done, the faster I would be at producing results. If you're in sales, this could look like producing a list of prospective leads and getting your clients feedback. If you're in product management or design, this could look like a quick mock-up and seeing if you're on the same page. It doesn't really matter what your situation or type of work is. You need to have clear collaboration on actual work that's going to be produced. Moreover, this will allow your client to get excited to work with you if you're providing a great sample at the start. That's why I work really hard to make sure that I curate a very impressive sample list. There was one client I converted from a free trial to paid just because of how great the sample was. If your clients are individuals, the sample work may come in the form of written activities, doing a full consultation or service, or sending amazing content and materials that'll be useful for them. So now, once this is all done, the next step is to start doing an intense combination of communicating and producing results. There should be one touch point each day, no matter what. You need them to keep you in their minds every damn day. This can come in the form of briefly speaking when you see them at the office, sending texts or Slack messages, or significant updates via email. The biggest thing here is to seem extremely excited by all the fast progress that's happening. It doesn't even matter what the actual progress is. You should twist it into seeming like major positive steps forward are happening with the work. What you're selling them on is that it's a joy to be working with you. In terms of the actual results you'll be producing, it needs to happen quickly. So the hardest you're going to work is going to be the very first few days of any engagement. There's no room for failure during this initial impression. So in my case, I reach out to a crazy amount of viable candidates and I only introduced the very best ones to the company as my first batch. As all of these great candidates were being introduced to the hiring manager at the company, I kept checking in to see how his calls with them were going. Any mistake needed to be immediately rectified on my side. By the end of the first week, I would do a formal meeting to sync up on everything that's happened. This would end up leading to some additional calibration. So for the second week, I had to show that I really listened so I made sure to make any even minor adjustment that they requested. And so the second they felt like I really cared and understood them, my emotional appeal was significantly amplified. Also, 
the quantity of my output stayed just as high. Again, during the second week, I still maintain daily touch points. If the excitement goes down, so does the chance of them converting to a paid client or staying for the long run. That's all the time we have for today's session. Tomorrow, we'll go into how you make sure your clients pay their invoices, establish a remote work arrangement with them, and start to reduce your workload with each client. I'll see you then. Thank you.